Thank you all very much. Um, it's really good to be here. Uh, and I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, thanks very much to Father Ed Foley uh, for inviting me. And, and he's been evangelizing me uh, about Chicago. Um, <laughs> so he's opened my eyes to uh, what a great city it is. Um, I always enjoy speaking about Francis and the Sultan because I think their story can be useful to us in a time of Christian-Muslim tension. Um, and although I, I've spoken, I don't know, maybe 30 times on the subject, I'm still li a little surprised to be doing what I'm doing because as a journalist, I'm not the kind of person you'd ordinarily expect to be writing on this subject. But thanks to the previous work of Franciscan scholars and other historians, and especially the excellent translations done by members of the Franciscan order, uh, non-experts like myself can delve quite deeply into the life of Francis of Assisi and maybe hopefully contribute something useful. At uh, some point between the um, World Trade Center attack and the start of the war in Iraq, I uh, chanced on a reference to Francis' encount encounter with Sultan Malik al Kamal uh, from a, in a book that was on my nightstand, The Willow Flowers of St. Francis. So I became very curious about it and discovered that it was indeed a historical event that Francis of Assisi did meet Sultan Malik al Kamal in 1219 in Egypt during the Fifth Crusade. And so I began uh, to look at Francis' life to try to understand how he came to be there and what he was trying to accomplish. I think it was probably an important event in Francis' life because if we look, we see that before he left for the East, he basically gave over control of his order. And when he returned, he was in poor health and he, he spent the remaining years of his life, I think, co coping maybe with some anger about what was happening in the order uh, and coming to terms with that. And um, anyway, when we look at Francis' life from the point of view of his journey to Egypt, we see that we can especially see the themes of peace and peacemaking and how central they were to it. It's well known that peace and penance were the cornerstone of Francis's message, but I, th I think it even goes deeper than what's well known, um, that his aversion to warfare and his yearning for peace are the foundation and core of his ministry. Now, the, the weekend before last, I caught the documentary Salinger about the uh, life of the writer J.D. Salinger. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to see that. The director put a strong emphasis on Salinger's traumatic experience in World War II, uh, something I was not aware of when I read Salinger's work as a student years ago. We find that Salinger took part in the Normandy landing and that he was at the forefront of combat in Europe for pretty much a solid year. He saw bodies piled up in concentration camps. He plumbed the depths of the Nazi psyche in his work as a counterintelligence officer. All this had a devastating impact on the young Salinger, and he suffered a nervous breakdown. And the director follows the impact of this experience through the rest of the documentary. And we can see how it played out in his fiction uh, and in how he chose to live his life as a, as a recluse. And, uh, someone who took great lengths to avoid all celebrity and, and who immersed himself in, in Eastern religions. And it, it made me think back to writing about Francis because Francis of Assisi was also a traumatized veteran. So for me, one key to understanding Francis is to keep his wartime experience in mind as we look at the whole of his life. <coughs> all the biographies of Francis mention that he took part in a bloody battle between his hometown of Assisi and Perugia, that he was taken prisoner, and that subsequently he underwent a gradual conversion to a life of penance. To understand Francis, we need to keep this formative experience in mind uh, in later chapters of his life, including his journey to Egypt. Now, in the Fifth Crusade, Christians attacked Egypt as a step toward conquering Jerusalem. They lay siege to Damietta, a city at the mouth of the Nile. Inside this city's three sets of walls, 80,000 people were dying of disease and starvation when Francis arrived at the scene. Eventually, he took it on himself 
to cross and over enemy lines and seek out the Sultan in his camp, which was a few miles south of Damietta along the Nile. He didn't succeed in his goal, which was to convert the Sultan, but he did win the Sultan's respect, and he was permitted to preach for several days before being sent back to the cru Crusader camp with a military escort. And think for a moment you know, how amazing that is, that the Sultan extended such a courtesy to a Christian, even as the Christian army a few miles away was trying to conquer his country. Francis was deeply affected by this encounter. When he went home, he wrote a new rule for his order that urged its members to live peaceful, peaceably among Muslims and to, quote, be subject to them. This was a revolutionary approach at the time because the crusade was still ongoing. The Sultan, for his part, made numerous attempts to achieve a peace treaty in the war. He ultimately won the war and shocked the Christians with the kindness he showed them when he not only spared their lives, but fed them and assisted their exit from Egypt. So those are the basic facts. Both men can serve as useful models for us today. Francis, because he recovered the Christian traditions of nonviolence, of befriending enemies, of skepticism for warfare. The Sultan, because of his wisdom as a leader, his friendly reaction to Francis, his sensitivity to Egypt's Christians, and his exemplary conduct at the end of the war, all of this rooted in his understanding of Islam, which he studied closely. I call Francis's journey a mission of peace because the evidence shows that he opposed the crusade. If he had converted the Sultan, as he somehow hoped, it might have ended the war. Now, I should say that historians are, di are divided very much on whether Francis opposed the crusade. Their debate focuses on a passage in one of the early medieval biographies of Francis, written by the friar Thomas of Celano. In it, Francis courageously speaks, preaches to the crusaders against going into battle. Because of the way the passage is worded, it's not entirely clear if he opposed going to battle on that particular day or if he imposed the, opposed the entire war. Now, Friar Thomas of Celano wrote the first life of Francis two or three years after his death in 1226 under a papal commission. Uh, he wrote a second one, The Remembrance of a Soul, uh, commissioned by the Franciscan Order in 1247. And the second one is the one that has this interesting scene in which Francis becomes anguished the night before a planned attack and believes that God has warned him, warned him it will fail. So he talks it over with an unnamed brother. Francis says, if the battle happens on this day, the Lord has shown me that it will not go well for the Christians. But if I say this, they will take me for a fool. And if I keep silent, my conscience won't leave me alone. What do you think I should do? The brother responds, this wouldn't be the first time people took you for a fool. <laughs> Unburden your conscience and fear God rather than men. So Francis preached vigorously against the battle, taking the risk that he would be labeled a security threat. Celano wrote, the saint leaped to his feet and rushed to the Christians, crying out warnings to save them, forbidding war and threatening disaster but they took the truth as a joke. They hardened their hearts and refused to turn back. Was Francis forbidding war or merely opposing battle on this day? The two phrases seem to contradict each other, hence the historical debate. Um, one historian wrote that for Francis to say that God found the battle unacceptable really undermined the whole rationale for the crusade, that God willed it. Uh, from the start, the crusade was always debated and promoted in, in religious language, beginning with shouts of God wills it. Before the Fifth Crusade, Pope Innocent III sent a letter to the Sultan's father warning him that this time God was on the Christian side. To say that it was against God's will to go to war on this day was to say that God had, had not blessed the war, dooming it to failure. And the term this day in the Christian worldview can mean more than the current 24-hour period also. Uh, consider our own contemporary catechism of the Catholic Church and what it says uh, on the phrase this day in the Our Father. This today is not only that of our mortal time, but also the today of God. This day is the day of the Lord, the day of the Feast of the Kingdom, 
anticipated in the Eucharist that is already the foretaste of the kingdom to come. Uh, the Dutch scholar Jan Hobricht, uh, a former Franciscan, uh, found further evidence that Francis had spoken out against the crusade by noting that Thomas of Chilano, writing in Latin, had Francis forbidding bellum or war and not pugnum or battle. And, and Dr. Hobrick's book, uh, Francis and Islam, I think has uh, opened the door to a lot of other people, myself included, uh, Sister Kathy Warren, uh, Franciscan sister who wrote on Francis and the Sultan also. Uh, we both say the same thing. Uh, 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 Dr. Hobrick's uh, Francis and Islam is a very important work. Um, anyway, um, on the day of the battle, the priests and bishops in the Christian camp accompanying the soldiers to the battlefield. They were led by Cardinal Pelagius, who was the papal legate. A piece of what was believed to be the true cross was carried along. During the battle, the priests prostrated themselves before this relic to pray for victory. Francis did not go, which I find interesting given that Francis, as we know, had such a great devotion to the cross, but not on this occasion, not when the cross was being <coughs> weaponized. Um, he stayed behind in the camp. Three times he sent one of his brothers to see if he could see what was happening. It seems that it was too much for Francis, the traumatized veteran, to look at it himself. As it turned out, the Christian army finally became visible, and it was a terrible sight because the soldiers were retreating in a mad dash for their camp. The battle was a horrific disaster for the Christians with thousands killed and some leading knights and clergymen captured. Sometime shortly after this battle, Francis set into motion his plan to approach the Sultan unarmed. <coughs> Personally, I do find the evidence pretty strong that Francis was opposing the war, not the battle. But in fairness, I think it may be more prudent to conclude that the one passage does not resolve it. Um, it may, it's ambiguous and maybe deliberately so. Some historians argue that Thomas of Chilano used this story to show Francis' prophetic power and therefore it must not be historical. But I would say both could be true. And there are a lot of other ways Fran Thomas of Chilano could have written about Francis' powers without kind of having to deal with the high, highly sensitive topic of the validity of the crusade. Keep in mind that as he wrote, around 1247, the seventh crusade was being readied. Like the fifth, it started all out also with an attack on Damietta. So the way I searched for an answer to these questions was to look at the larger context who Francis was, and what motivated him. When you do that, the inescapable conclusion is that Francis was forbidding war, that he was oppo uh, opposing the crusade. To understand what drove Francis, we need to go back to the story of his conversion. We know the story of Francis at prayer in the uh, chapel of San Damiano, and hearing the words, Francis, repair my church. But as you know, that is only part of the story we can piece together from the early bi biographies of Francis. The larger picture is that Francis had been traumatized by his devastating experience as a soldier and prisoner of war. Once he recovered from his trauma, he adopted a radical countercultural lifestyle that made it impossible for him ever to go to war again. Uh, quite disconnected from any discussion of Francis, the historian Laura Martinez uh, once observed too often in the 13th century Italian city, doing the restrained or peaceful thing would have required the renunciation of self-identity. That really tells Francis' story. Uh, without a radical change in his life, it would have been impossible for a young ma merchant such as Francis to avoid being drawn again and again into the terrible violence of his divided city. Now picture Francis on a day in November of 1202. The Assisians are heading into war with Perugia. It's a battle driven by money. Merchants in, in Assisi, fed up with the aristocrats, had driven them out of town. They took refuge nearby. The Assisi, um, re they took refuge in nearby Perugia, which was a larger and more powerful and more warlike city that was all too eager to use this dispute as a pretext for attacking Assisi. So picture Francis, he's a cavalryman, not the way we're used to thinking of him, as a knight. Uh, he's wearing chain mail. Um, he's outfitted in full battlefield regalia. His father was a wealthy man. He, could, he had you know, 
the horse, the whole works. Um, he carries weapons, I don't know, a sword, maybe a lance, don't know for sure. Uh, you know, there's a lot of art, some of you might know better than I would, uh, there's a lot of art uh, depicting scenes in Francis's life. I've never seen a work that puts a weapon in his hands. Um, but at this moment, he, he was a soldier outfitted to kill. Um, soon after, the two armies clashed on a hill called Calistrata on the banks of the Tiber River. Uh, right now, it's behind the Calistrata Mall. Uh, <laughs> but still a lovely spot, uh, <laughs> Umbria's largest mall. Um, these battles open with a charge of the cavalry. So there's Francis right in the front. The Assisi knights are all sons of merchants. The Perugians are aristocrats who grew up from boyhood learning how to do this. And needless to say, the Assisians were massacred. Imagine what that was like for Francis. He saw his fleeing friends hunted down like animals. He was captured, but his life was spared only because of the ransom he could bring from having a wealthy father. He was deposited in an underground prison of sorts in Perugia. Uh, today, the, it's believed that the, a building, a Renaissance building called the Palace of the Captain of the Peoples, uh, Captain of the People, is uh, located over where this was. Uh, jails in the form we have them today uh, didn't exist at this point in the 13th century. They took shape later in the 13th century with bars and things like that. Um, this was just a deep, uh, dark hole in the ground, cutting far into some rocky Etruscan ruins that were there. And today, there's stores built down into this cliff, little shops, and you can take an elevator down to each floor. It goes down four floors. So this was a deep hole in the ground. Now, I can't say for sure that Francis suffered what we would call today um, post-traumatic stress disorder, since the medieval documents don't offer enough detail to see if the clinical criteria were met, as a US Army psychiatrist told me. But I did speak to a leading Army expert on the psychology of war, who told me that based on what we do know, Francis would certainly have suffered survivor guilt, and that a year in the sensory deprivation of an unlit underground jail, quote, would be enough to shatter any human being. Whatever he went in there with, he would have left there fundamentally a changed human being. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, uh, said that as an instructor at West Point, he taught students about a U.S. flyer who uh, was tortured as a prisoner in North Vietnam. When the flyer talked about, what the flyer talked about most upon his release was what it was like to be deprived of light. It's devastating. As Thomas of Chilano recounts, Francis was a changed human being after his release. What he attributed to God's judgment, we might ascribe today to psychological trauma. He says that Francis was too ill to leave the house. Once a very carefree young man, he was now depressed, walking with a cane. When he finally went outside, he felt empty as he looked at fields and hills that once delighted him. From that day on, Thomas of Chilano wrote, he began to despise himself and to hold in contempt the things he had admired and loved before. So we see that the move toward conversion began after this trauma of war and imprisonment. Francis did make one more attempt to go to war after he convalesced. Filled with dreams of becoming a knight, he signed with to fight in a war in Apulia being fought between Pope Innocent III and the forces of the Holy Roman Emperor. Not that holy, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, most historians believed, uh, believe he would have fought on the Pope's side. On the, on the road south, Francis felt increasingly uneasy, no doubt triggered by memories of the battlefield. According to various early accounts, he dreamed of a beautiful palace filled with gleaming weapons, and at first this reassured him, but as he rode on, he became very uneasy. And then in Spoleto, he had another dream, hearing God's voice direct him to turn back from the path to war. It's difficult to assess these accounts literally, but they do, I think, offer at least a gauge of the emotions Francis was experiencing at this time of his life. It's also interesting to note that in turning back, Francis was essentially uh, rejecting the crusade, because uh, Pope Innocent, eager to get soldiers so that he could hold on to his papal lands, took, within the worldview of that time, uh, a very questionable step of treating his war in southern Italy like a crusade. Um, he gave uh, anyone who fought for him uh, the crusade privilege, which means remission of sins. 
Uh, and the head of the Pope's army, Walter of Brienne, was planning to continue on to take part in the Fourth Crusade. Um, the medieval documents don't say that by refusing to fight in Apulia, Francis opposed the crusade. Thomas of Celano could just not have written that in a biography commissioned by a pope, Gregory IX, who pursued the crusades vigorously. But one of the other Franciscan accounts did provide an interesting hint by noting that when, when Francis dreamed of a, fa of a palace filled with gleaming weaponry, there's a little detail that the shields had crosses on them, the symbol of the crusades. Anyway, for Francis, all that gleaming weaponry was now a bright, shining lie. After this, he went home, sold his horse, weaponry, and clothing, gave everything to the poor, eventually began to live a life of radical poverty and penance. He saw his turning point, as you know, as the moment when he uh, worked up the courage to kiss a leper. Uh, he began to repair church, churches, which, is, which was a way at that time that military men atoned for their sins on the battlefield. In the book, I speculate, I discuss whether Francis, who insisted on his own need for repentance throughout his life, very insistently, uh, whether he might have killed others during the Battle of Colostrata. As a result of his radical lifestyle, Francis was attacked in the streets, beaten up by his father and others, and he submitted willingly because he had adopted nonviolence as the only sane response to the violence that had dragged him down. For quite a few years, Francis and his followers faced violence and persecution. Even to sympathetic outsiders, like the Bishop of Assisi, the severe life Francis exulted in seemed insane. Uh, the bishop uh, once remarked to him, it seems to me that it is a very hard and difficult thing to possess nothing in the world. It made absolute sense to Francis. He said, my lord, if we had any possessions, we should also be forced to have arms to protect them, since possessions are a cause of disputes and strife, and in many ways we should be hindered from loving God and our neighbor. Therefore, in this life, we wish to have no temporal possessions. I think that quote is a key to understanding Francis's conversion. He was keenly aware that voluntary poverty distanced him from the military life that had nearly destroyed him and was killing so many others. Francis could see plainly that the greed dominating the society around him was directly linked to the pervasive violence. He wanted no part of it. Francis is famous for his poverty, but we need to recognize that his poverty grew out of his desire for peace and peacemaking. As a group of men coalesced around him, Francis took steps to make sure that there was no way any of them could get dragged into warfare. He barred them and later his third order, composed of lay people, from swearing oaths. These feudal oaths of loyalty were important in medieval life. That was how you raised an army. You got other people to pledge their loyalty, and they had no choice when they were called in to honor that pledge. It was a bold move for Francis to, to bar these loyalty oaths. He barred his brothers from even riding a horse, which kept them also from doing what he had done in war. He forbade them to seek favors from church officials because he did not want them to become ensnared in the church's power struggles. Francis adopted a greeting of peace that, for that time, was very unusual. May the Lord give you peace. He said God told him to use th this greeting, and in that violent era, it ruffled people. A brother told Francis that people greeted in this manner would ask indignantly what this greeting of yours meant. The brother told Francis that this embarrassed him and asked that he be permitted to use a different greeting. Francis responded, let them chatter, for they do not understand the ways of God. Don't feel ashamed because of this, for one day the nobles and princes of this world will respect you and the other friars for this greeting. The story ended with a remark from Francis about how the little people were close to God. The people who didn't understand were the nobles and princes of this world, that is, the lords of war. Peace and peacemaking were central to Francis's ministry. That meant seeking to achieve the absence of violence and war, but I think it's important to remember also a more transcendent peace, the peace of God's eternal this day. There are stories of Francis's specific intervention in warfare in Arezzo, Bologna, Siena, and Perugia. They show that at the core of his being, Francis was repulsed by war. He transformed his entire life to escape what it had done to him. He wanted his friars not only to avoid violence, but all contentiousness and the vices that led to it, greed and pride. 
From his deathbed, he intervened to prevent an angry dispute to, for, between Assisi's mayor and bishop from escalating. Another question I examine in the book is whether Francis would have supported the crusade out of obedience. And indeed, Francis' own writings put great emphasis on obeying church authorities. But for Francis, there always was a higher authority, God. Putting his conscience first, he instructed, putting conscience first, he instructed his, his brothers that there were times they might have to disobey a church authority. So I do think that Francis opposed the crusade. One of the strongest pieces of evidence, I find, is what's not there. Um, there's no evidence that he ever preached the crusade, even though his supporters in Rome were avid supporters of it. In detective terms, that's the dog that didn't bark. The early accounts of his life, written either on commission of a crusade pope or under a pope's influence, would certainly have mentioned if he had supported the crusade. Francis believed in being a, obedient to church authorities, but at the same time, his simple lifestyle and emphasis on peacemaking exposed ways the official church was sometimes out of touch with the gospel. There was no concept of free speech as we know it. Francis taught by example. He was a performer by nature. As a young man before his military service, he'd been the life of the party. We remember him now for the kindness he showed to animals, but we don't necessarily see what he was driving at his outrageous acts of compassion for lambs being led to slaughter, hooked fish, birds, worms on the sidewalk, were a kind of performance meant to shock human beings in, into loving one another. I'm sure he had that love for animals too, but I think he was after more. Uh, Thomas Chalano commented on this. Imagine how much love he had for human beings since he showed so much compassion for animals. Francis's unarmed trip to the Sultan was also a kind of performance a shocking display of nonviolence in the midst of war. So Francis didn't turn off his search for peace when he went for Egypt. It was an intrinsic part of who he was. Now Francis went to the Sultan with the goal of converting him to Christianity, his way of making peace in the crusade. I realize that this is a poor model for interreligious dialogue today, <laughs> to say the least. Um, when I was working on the book, I discussed that with Syed Hossein Nasser. He's a leading scholar of Islam at George Washington University, um, and also a leader in the international uh, Muslim-Catholic dialogue. In fact, I believe he was the one who addressed Pope Benedict in behalf of the, uh, in, in behalf of the Muslims involved in the common word. Uh, he said that within the context of the time, this was the only way it could have happened. We couldn't expect Francis to have our post-Vatican II understanding of interreligious relations. What's significant, Dr. Nasser said, is that Francis approached the Sultan unarmed, without a hint of coercion, and full of respect and courtesy. And what about the Sultan? He really was an extraordinary figure and also a model worth remembering today. After much uncertainty, he managed to triumph in the Fifth Crusade. The Christian leaders didn't understand the Nile, allowing the Sultan's troops to trap them using sluice gates to raise the level of, their ri of the river. They were in mud up to their waist. The crusaders who had rejected peace offers many times then asked for the Sultan for peace. I just want to look at one short excerpt from the book. Uh, that's my copy there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and the scene is, there was a period of negotiations going on, and Sultan al Kamal, I'm just going to read a little bit. Sultan al Kamal showed an extraordinary level of kindness to John of Brienne and other hostages, according to the history of the patriarchs of the Egyptian church. That's a Coptic account that was very helpful to me. He threw a banquet for the war-weary Christian hostages and the churchmen and aristocrats taken prisoner two years earlier, holding court in a vast high roof tent. The crusaders were astounded at the reception they got. Sultan al Kamal and Jean de Brienne, he was the, this very dashing uh, epitome of chivalry uh, Frenchman who uh, was the military leader of the, of the uh, crusade. Sultan al Kamal and Jean de Brienne became such great friends that some whispered that the crusade leader who had risked his life time and again during the long battle was in collusion with the Muslims. In the midst of the feast, al Kamal set out, Jean de Brienne wept. 
The Sultan quickly asked why, and John responded that he was thinking of his soldiers who were dying of hunger. It was not unusual during such occurrences in the in occasions in the Crusades for the aristocrats on both sides to treat one another with great courtesy, but al Kamal distinguished himself by providing generously for the starving soldiers who were ensnared along the Nile. He sent them an ample bounty of bread, pomegranates, and melons. He opened the way for merchants to visit the Christian camp to trade food. For 15 days, Sultan al Kamal fed the Christian army. After the leaders at Damietta and the newly arrived crusaders there angrily accepted the surrender, hostages were released. al Kamal provided the Christian army with passage out of Egypt, selling ships at what a Christian chronicle said was a fair price. When the Muslim governor of Damietta tried to stop the crusaders from taking home the impressive masts that remained from some of their battered ships, the Christians complained to al Kamal. He insisted that the Christians be given their masts. al Kamal also built a bridge over the Nile to speed up the Christian army's withdrawal. Uh, generous, but also wise to get the enemy out of your country, right? <laughs> um, now, during the war, as happens, you know, the, the Christian side, of course, demonized the Sultan. They called him a cruel beast. They likened him to passages, you know, from uh, the Book of the Apocalypse and, and so forth. You know, he, he was evil personified. So after it's all over, um, one of the uh, architects of the crusade, literally an architect for the crusade, and a future cardinal, Oliver of Paderborn, wrote uh, to him, uh, wrote about this. He said, the Sultan was moved by such compassion toward us that for many days he freely revived and refreshed our whole multitude. Who could doubt that such kindness, mildness, and mercy proceeded from God? Those whose parents, sons, and daughters, brothers and sisters, we killed with various tortures, whose property scattered or whom we cast naked from their dwellings, refreshed us with their own food as we were dying of hunger, although we were in their dominion and power. And so with great sorrow and mourning, we left the port of Damietta and according to our different nations, we separated to our everlasting disgrace. Um, that was the kind of man Sultan al Kamal was. The Crusaders actually thought he secretly wanted to be a Christian. Um, but I think the key to understanding him is that he was a good Muslim. He was devoted to the teachings of the great Sunni scholar, Imam al Shafi. He built a beautiful dome over the Imam's tomb in Cairo that you can see today. He built religious schools. He had a great interest in Sufism. Uh, he brought the leading Sufi poets of the day to his court. Uh, his religious advisor was steeped in Persian Sufism, uh, which is known for its openness to other religions. Some say the Sultan would have appreciated similarities between Francis and the Sufis he knew. In the um, Coptic account I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, Sultan al Kamal is portrayed in very favorable terms. He's probably the most favorable Sultan to the Christians in Egypt's history, which is another reason he's a good model for today. He was called on to intervene in religious disputes among the Christians, including a major squabble over who would be the Coptic patriarch. And he did so with great respect for their traditions. One time there was a dispute about whether a mosque or a church should be built on a site in Cairo. He inspected, decided that a church had already been on the site first, and he ruled in favor of the Christian minority, and he took some heat for that. I remember when I first started out researching the book, I noticed that Al-Qaeda had issued communiques that called its fighters descendants of Saladin. Well, Sultan al-Kamal actually was a, a descendant of Saladin. He was his nephew. Um, so I would look to him to define what it would mean to be an authentic descendant of Saladin. One challenge in writing this book was to sort through the different accounts of the meeting between Francis and the Sultan to determine what is true and what is false in them. There are at least 15 accounts from the 13th century, all Western. Uh, in general, the later they are, the more they tend to begin to portray the, the encounter as confrontational. In my view, the later they are, the less credible. Um, and I'll explain as we go along. Uh, Francis decided to make his move toward the Sultan during a lull in the fighting in September of 1219. The Sultan had made his most comprehensive peace offer to date, offering to turn over Jerusalem to the Crusaders. Jean de Brienne, who, by the way, is buried in the Basilica of St. Francis, wanted to accept it. But Cardinal Pelagius, the papal legate who took over the crusade, wanted to continue with the war, 
with the aim of conquering all Egypt, hoping to provide an ample perimeter to secure Jerusalem. Leaders of the armies from the Italian port cities sided with him, perhaps for commercial reasons, Damietta being a valuable port. According to the Chronicle of Renewal, a French crusader account, the cardinal did not want Francis to go to the sultan, warning him of the danger and also implying that Francis had suspect motives. Francis held his ground. And finally, the cardinal relented, basically saying, go ahead, but if you get killed, it's not my fault. Um, so we see that just by crossing the battlefield in a, during a tense time in the peace negotiations, Francis was, through his example, showing that it was possible to talk to the enemy. We don't have video of the meeting between Sultan and Francis, and we don't have an NSA record as far as we know. Uh, so the, uh, the most reliable account is a letter that the French bishop Jacques de Vitry, also a future cardinal, sent home from the Crusades. Um, he was an ardent crusader who was on the Fifth Crusade. Um, in a few paragraphs, he talks about this surprising encounter between Francis and the Sultan and portrays it as entirely peaceful. He elaborates this on this a little bit in another history he wrote, a larger <coughs> history he wrote a, couple, a few years later. I consider his the most credible account because he was closest in time to what happened. He was present in the Crusader camp. Uh, he was a strong supporter of the Crusade. Um, he wasn't trying to make the case for Francis' sainthood, which becomes a factor for later writers. Um, it was a private communication. Um, and his account is unaffected by disputes that in the later Franciscan counts, I think, are affected by disputes within the order as you get later into the 13th century. Um, anyway, Francis would have started out with his usual greeting, may the Lord give you peace. The Sultan would likely have responded in kind. And the Quran, as I understand it, says, say not to those who greet you with peace, you are not a believer. When Francis came before him, the Sultan <laughs> thought he might be carrying a message from the military uh, side of the crusader camp for peace negotiations, but Francis quickly made it clear that wasn't the case, that he had come for purposes of conversion. He called, he called himself and the friar who went with him, Illuminato, uh, ambassadors for Christ. He started out, if you wish to believe us, and I think that if made all the difference. There was no hint of coercion, just courtesy. Uh, the Sultan responded with hospitality, permitting Francis to remain in his court and preach for several days. One account from the early 14th century says that the Sultan gave Francis the right to enter Jerusalem to visit the Holy Sepulchre, but we really don't know if Francis actually did go to Jerusalem. If you visit Assisi today, you can see an ivory horn that the Sultan is said to have given Francis, who used it to call the brothers to prayer. It's hard to determine if this is historically accurate, but it's certainly possible, maybe even likely. Another clue to what happened between Francis and the Sultan is that, as I said earlier, upon his return, Francis revised the rules order, the order's rule, after, uh, to suggest that a good way for his friars to approach Muslims would be simply to live in peace among them <coughs> without preaching or getting into disputes, just to be subject to them. What about the Sultan's reaction to Francis? The Islamic scholar Mahmoud Ayyub told me that the Sultan's respect for Francis reflects a Muslim tradition of reverence towards holy Christian monks. The Quran says that the monk's eyes brim with tears at the sound of God's name. This tradition goes back to the prophet Muhammad who would have encountered the Christian monks in the desert. And it may account even today for reception Franciscans can get uh, in Muslim lands. Francis' encounter with a Muslim leader was a bit of an embarrassment for the early Christian biographers who wrote accounts that aimed to show what a great saint he was, for how could such a great saint be friendly with the church's enemy? Some accounts portrayed Francis as naive. As more than four decades passed, a new account by St. Bonaventure portrayed the encounter as much more confrontational, that Francis challenged the Sultan's religious advisor to an ordeal by fire, which the Sultan said no thanks to. I explain in some detail in the book why I think we can't take this uh, as a historical account. Um, but some very famous art depicted uh, this, this supposed scene of a challenge to a trial by fire. 
uh, and that became the enduring image of the encounter. Um, if you look at this uh, artwork on the screen, that's the first, the earliest known representation. Uh, it dates to about 1245. It's in the Basilica of Santa Croce in Florence. And it's based on the whatever accounts that come earlier. I can't be sure who the artist got it from. But uh, at that point, the, account, the uh, encounter was always presented as entirely peaceful. And you see in this, this work of art, it is entirely peaceful. Um, let's try another one. Um, around 1300, uh, Giotto, d there are two works attributed to him. Uh, one of them is in the famous cycle of paintings in the Basilica, the Upper Basilica of St. Francis. And so here we see um, the story that's come down uh, through Bonaventure's major legend of St. Francis. It's actually a little over-dramatized -dram because, as I said, according to Bonaventure, the the sultan said, no, we don't, we don't have to have a trial by fire, but, fire. but here we see the fire. That, that, that's a little <laughs> dramatic touch. Um, but, um, and this really, I, I think the art has a lot to do with, with how the story um, was recounted for the next centuries that followed. And al also uh, in 1266, again, facing, Bonaventure's facing a very difficult situation of trying to save the Franciscan order from a heresy scandal. And the, the order had a lot of enemies in, in the universities. And, uh, and uh, um, so his, his life with Francis drains it of any hint that he might have done anything remotely different from uh, what the church authorities might have wanted. Um, I reject the idea of this trial by fire for a lot of reasons that I detail in the book. One is that. In 1215, the Fourth Lateran, Council, Fourth Lateran Council forbade trial by ordeal. Uh, and Francis was very conscious, I think, of what that council had decreed. Um, also, it conflicts with what Francis says in his writings about loving the enemy and going peacefully among Muslims. Really, our, our best guide to Francis is his own writings. I think most of the scholars would say that. And finally, as I discuss at length in the book, there was a lot of political pressure on Bonaventure to re recreate Francis in a way that removed any hint that he challenged the authorities of his day, something Bonaventure needed to do to preserve the order. Um, uh, here's no another version by Giotto. I think this is the one in the Basilica of St. Francis, if I remember right. Um, and another, th this inspired lots of other versions that were basically along the same theme. But now, <laughs> this is, this is a, an interesting one. Uh, this is a painting by Benozzo Gozzoli around 1452. Um, and note the time frame because it was a time of renewed conflict um, just before the fall of Constantinople. And Gozzoli gives us the fire, but also a separate story that emerged about 100 years after Francis died. Uh, I believe it's in the Little Flowers. Um, that while Francis was in Egypt, a woman tried to seduce him. Uh, the medieval document calls her a certain woman who is very beautiful in face and body, but very foul in mind and soul. Uh, um, Francis supposedly removed his clothes and lay in the fire in her fireplace as if it were a bed, showing her the error of her ways. Now, in the Cazzoli painting, uh, he conflates the two stories. Nowhere in the actual text does it bring them together. It has nothing to do with the Sultan. Um, <coughs> The inscription on the painting says that the sultan used the woman to try to tempt Francis. So that's an invention of the artist. Now, just remember, in real life, we saw that the crusaders gave a glowing account of Sultan al Kamal. But as years passed, he was being portrayed in Christian art as a smarmy, immoral villain. So we have to sadly say that the encounter between the saint and the sultan didn't, at least immediately, accomplish much in terms of interreligious understanding or, or peacemaking. Christians and Muslims continue to fight one another. But yet, there's a lot to think about today, I think, in terms of ministry. Uh, for one thing, we know that storytelling is essential in the traditions in the, of the great religions, and this is a great story. Uh, many stories can be taken from history that could be used to fuel resentment between Christians and Muslims. But here is a story that guides our feet on the path to peace. In recent decades, the Franciscan order in particular 
has rediscovered this story, and it has inspired the Franciscans and others to engage in peacemaking. I spoke to one Franciscan in Assisi who applied it in this way in the 80s. He and other friars met separately with Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev to convince them, trying to convince them to see each other as human beings before they met in negotiations. It's very much modeled after Francis and the Sultan, see each other as human beings, it makes a difference. Um, I was in touch with a Franciscan priest from South Africa who had sent teams of friars all over Africa to mediate and avert various conflicts. He too was inspired by this story. So was the Islamic scholar I mentioned earlier, Dr. Nasser. Uh, who told me that it led him to go and pray at Laverna. Um, so it's just a story, uh, one brief and long overlooked historical encounter, but stories can resonate with meaning, and, and this one does because Francis and the Sultan offer us a path for today. Each firmly believed in his respective faith tradition. For them, that didn't mean hatred or violence. Rather, it meant that they respected each other and preferred peace to war. Francis saw through the propaganda of his time. He didn't demonize Muslims. He took the risk of crossing the battlefield even when the cardinal in charge of the crusade had tried to stop him. Nor did Sultan al-Kamal treat Francis as an enemy, which would have been very easy to do in the midst of war. He was open to hearing Francis even though he had come from the enemy's camp. Now I couldn't finish this talk without noting that our new pope has taken the name Francis. Like St. Francis, Pope Francis, has sh already shown a talent for the symbolic gesture right from the start of his papacy. These are gestures aimed at changing hearts and minds, a way of focusing on the church, focusing the church on the essentials of the Christian message. You know, if the church feels surrounded today by secularism in Francis' time, St. Francis' time, the concern was the growing popularity of heretic movements. St. Francis did not respond with condemnation or strident preaching against the heretics. Instead, he taught through loving example. While the heretic Cathar movement taught that creation was evil, Francis embraced the goodness of creation in creative and startling ways. When opponents of the church denied the Eucharist, he went out of his way to express reverence for it. Even as Pope Innocent III launched his various crusades, Francis did not preach war against non-believers. Instead, he preached peace wherever he went. Andre Fauché, a leading expert on medieval sainthood, touches on this in his new biography of St. Francis, which was recently released in English, uh, translated by Michael F. Cusato. He writes that Francis did not lose himself in recriminations and carefully avoided all fruitless polemic. In contrast to his contemporary St. Dominic, his primary objective was not to defend the church against his adversaries or even to proclaim sacred doctrine by refuting the errors of heretics, but to communicate to all men and women of his day the fundamental certitudes that animated him, God is good and full of love. The historic interview that Pope Francis recently gave and his focus on God's mercy are very much in this vein. Uh, God's mercy is also very important in Islam. So one senses that perhaps a common ground, there's a common ground for future discussions. I think we're going to see that improving relations with Muslims will be important to Pope Francis. So in that sense, the seeds that Francis planted, St. Francis planted long ago may just be beginning to sprout. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Can you take a few questions? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, the professor has been willing to take a few questions. I will try to uh, identify uh -huh. and invite you okay. to uh, Roger. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When I was teaching this uh, story in 2002, a year after 9-11, I had my first Muslim student class. Mm -hmm. And after I told the story, he said, so we also have this story in Muslim. <coughs> now I asked him, do you have them writing? You know? And he said, well, I did you know. So I had to follow up from there. And what I, what I found out through others is that it's an oral tradition. It also tells a very favorable uh, reaction or uh, interchange between the two. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know anything more about that. It's like the great white whale. I've never was able to find anything written down anywhere. Um, uh, it may still come to light someday. I, I think as the story gets 
more known in the Muslim world, and I think it, it, it has been. Uh, there's more Muslim scholars who are showing an interest in it. They may be better at finding it than I, than I or uh, other Western writers would be. So I hope so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one of the things that impressed me is uh, how you stressed how he brought back uh, elements of those 99 holy names of uh, the Muslim right. religion and incorporated them into chapter 23, I think it is, of his first rule, you know, and many other things. But uh, I have my question mm -hmm. is uh, I also heard. Francis was so inspired by the calling to worship uh, five times a day that when he came back, he wrote a letter to the leaders of towns and cities and things like that, encouraging them to do the same. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you found any link with that and the practice that existed throughout Europe and even here in the States of the Angel. Bells yeah. Times a day. Yeah. The f the first thing you uh, the first part of what you said. Um, so Francis did write a prayer that scholars feel has uh, a similarity to the Muslims' 99 most beautiful names of God. Um, um, the second one you're referring to, the letter, what's called the letter to the rulers of the people. Uh, it's a rather sternly word letter that he wrote, saying it's, it's the job of the ruler to make sure everybody gathers. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a call to prayer, and everybody uh, prays together. And um, I, I, you know, I did not research the history of the Angelus to see how it might tie in. Maybe someone here might know, might be able to respond better. But um, so I, I don't know. But there is that there is that similarity for sure. Um, and a, a number of scholars feel that uh, having seen uh, this call to prayer in Egypt. Francis came back, and he, he didn't say in his letter, we have to do this just like the Muslims, but, but they feel that it did influence him, that, that maybe he saw a certain beauty uh, in, what, in what was going on there, um, uh, although entirely from you know, seeing it as a Christian. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, it never occurred to me to explore that. Is that is that a topic that people have written on? I or, or I, I never I never heard that, that connection I've before. Have you? Yeah. And and do you you think that it, it ties in, in in some way? I, I think, but I'm I'm not completely convinced. Yeah. I, I don't do that kind of research, but yeah. I had to offer a reflection once, and that's the first thing that came to my mind is if if Francis asked by war. Yeah. Right. Chapel, right. The so that's interesting. Yeah, I don't. I didn't. Miss it. I hadn't thought of that. But I, <laughs> I thought I covered every angle I could get, but I missed that one. Because <laughs> you know, it, uh, the book really it's it's more like circumstantial because because um, you know the medieval documents are difficult to work with. You don't quite know how to take them, so you get, you, the book kind of builds up a circumstantial case. So I really tried to gather as go in as many directions, but that's one I hadn't thought of. <laughs> Thank you. I remember when you were talking a little bit about Francis' zeal for martyrdom throughout much of his life after mm -hmm. uh, his conversion. I was wondering if you could say something about it here, particularly just with your, your best speculation. Did Francis think he was going to come home from this or was there what did it surprise you that he was a walk out? I yeah. I think um, from his point of view it was a very very dangerous thing to do. And and it was uh, um, he had, first of all, he had no, I don't think he had any idea that the Sultan 
had good relations with Christians in Egypt, and, and, and as far as he knew, the sultan, you know, would have just executed him on the spot. So, so, I, so he took a great risk. Um, what I came away with was that Francis was ready to die, but he didn't do it because he wanted to die. Uh, there were a lot of things he wanted to do with his life, and, and so, um, and I, in the book I use a quote from Gandhi somewhere uh, about those who are into nonviolence have to be ready to die, but I think it's different from wanting to. And, and I talked to <coughs> Father Cusato, who I just mentioned earlier, you know, um, uh, I remember talking to him about that same thing, that, that was his feeling that, um, although the documents do portray this as, as a quest for martyrdom, uh, it, 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 it doesn't, it wouldn't go, we didn't think, it, I don't think it went quite that far, um, but there's no question that he was extremely brave and ready to suffer any consequences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. This goes way, way, way back, so I could be wrong in my historical evidence, but I think the ringing of the bells for the mm -hmm. Angelus, mm -hmm. which we call the Angelus, because the Angelus, I don't know if it existed at that time yet, yeah. but the ringing of the bells are from the Narbonne Constitution of Bonaventure. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. uh, but my question is, mm -hmm. what, what led you to write this book? What was the inspiration, you know, for writing this book? Y you know, um, I was a reporter at New York Newsday, as Father Ed said, and about the last thing I did at New York Newsday was write the main story, the front page story of the 9-11 attack. But I had, taken, I had taken a job as a teacher, so the jobs overlapped by a couple of weeks, so I was still in the newsroom for a little bit. And then I was out of it. It was it. I was it was over. And everybody I knew in, in New York journalism was doing a great job, you know, for a year or more describing what, what this meant in the world. And uh, I was kind of on the sidelines. And and so that does give you the chance to maybe take the long view, uh, which they people in the newsroom couldn't really do. Um, and I had been the paper's religion reporter. Uh, I had written some things on Islam. I was interested. Um, and when I found this, I think it's, it gave me a way to channel that feeling, like you should be doing something, you know, what can you do? And I, 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 that's really kind of what, what uh, got me into it, uh, was that feeling that I wanted to be part of this, this discussion. Uh, and I was, having been a religion writer, I, I was kind of concerned with the way Islam was being portrayed. I, I knew that, that um, Al-Qaeda was, was a very narrow view of it. And, um, so it made me want to do something. So we, you know, we can all do different things, and my things is, you know, basically I was trained to, to write and tell stories. So that, that was my, uh, my way of getting involved, I guess. So. Thanks. Thank you, thanks for the question, yeah. Hmm? John? So have you had any conversations with Muslims in New York City based on this book? I'm trying to remember if I did anything right in, in New York City, though. I don't think so. Uh, but quite a bit. Uh, it's being translated in, 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 in Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim country. So there, there, there is some interest. Um, but uh, I've spoken at a number of mosques, and I've spoken at um, a number of things in which there was a, a Muslim respondent. And, and it's a good experience because um, um, actually learning more about the Sultan and how he would have seen this because they, these scholars obviously have a command of the Quran that I, I wouldn't have. So um, the reaction's been pretty good. I, I've, I've talked in a number of campuses where uh, uh, Christian and Muslim students were brought together, and, and it, it seemed to go well. So I've, I've had a good, a, a good reaction uh, from Muslims. It's, again, it's, it's a little foreign to many of them. They may not know who St. Francis is, for starters. And, and, um, but once they start hearing it, they, they kind of like it. Uh, so, so it's, it's, it's been a good, good that way. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what reaction the book will get published in a country that's mostly Muslim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To follow up, I guess mm -hmm. my larger concern is that you're taking a kind of an area of speculation going here on. Pakistan, uh, 
Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know if I can solve a problem, John. That's been been such a problem for some, for, for such a problem for people who are very smart. Um, um, but um, you know, I I think part of it is to um, build alliances uh, and isolate the that would I isolate the, uh, the 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 radical fringe. Um, uh, from the standpoint of the story of Francis and the Sultan, I think the Sultan is a terrific example for Muslims, just, uh, just as Francis is such a great example for Christians. Uh, the Sultan got along very well with Christians, and, and he was 100% Islamic, you know, loved his faith, studied it deeply, uh, and he draws from what he, the Islamic scholars I've talked to can trace the very specific passages in the Quran that explain his behavior. Um, you know, I, 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 I would like to see that uh, better, better known. I, I did speak at a school in Cairo when I went there to do research. It was a Christian school run by, by I think, Carmelite sisters. Um, but the students were all, 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 almost all Muslims, I think. Well, maybe about two-thirds Muslims. And, um, and uh, the students knew who the Sultan was. They didn't know who St. Francis was, but they knew, they knew who the Sultan was. And I was very impressed because you have a history as long as Egypt's, and you know the Sultan. But they knew he was, he was kind and strong, uh, they said. And you know, I'd like to see that kind of model um, in in places like Pakistan and Egypt because it, it is it is uh, terrible to see what's happening. But um, and, uh, unfortunately, in Egypt, it seems that whenever there's bad times, it, the Christians tend to suffer. They t they suffer terribly during the Crusade, the Egyptian Christians, because people became suspicious of them. You know. Um, and even the Sultan couldn't hold back some of the things that were happening to them in the, uh, in the Fifth Crusade. So it just seems whenever there's turmoil in the Middle East, the, the Christians really um, have a bad time, which is not to say that plenty of other people who are not Christians have, have not suffered a great deal also. But yeah, it's, it's and I wish I had a better answer for you. That's true. So I wonder how much of that, you know, and I'm, I'm not in any way justifying crucifixion of Christians, but how much, I mean, in your studies, uh, I mean, you started with this, that the Francis went to, you know, to proselytize. Um, I mean, uh, other traditional religions in the East particularly, I mean, that really is a, a, a stumbling block for them to accept a religion that they've been right. proselytized. Well, remember, you know, Francis came back from the crusade with the whole idea of just living peacefully among Muslims. Now, that's a form of seeking converts too, the, the, but but it's 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 a form that other people can live with uh, of just just giving example. And I in tw late in the book, I can't just I just can't remember the specifics now. Um, I noted uh, in Rome some some uh, different statements from. Uh, you know, superior of the, of the Franciscans um, uh, dealing with, with just that question. And I, I think there was a willingness to, um, to kind of take that approach that Francis suggests, not, not to go out and preach, but simply to live peacefully, set example. Um, and uh, now, now there's, of course, different kinds of Christians too, and some put a greater uh, emphasis on, on conversion than others, so that, that becomes another issue. So. Um, uh, but yes, no, it's, it's, it definitely is a turn off, uh, prosel proselytizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well,
when I, no, I'm fine. Great questions. Okay. Thank you all very much. I really love speaking with you.